My first panic attack took place in a grade 8 math classroom. The teacher was up at the board, and what should have been an interesting formula that he was putting out with chalk on the green background was torture. I heard each and every sound as if it was an earthquake, and my lungs were on fire. I felt like I was having to draw a giant sword into my lungs, and I ultimately ran out of the classroom, went across the parking lot into the church in front of the high school, and I was sitting there staring at the cross, and all I could see was even more panic-inducing images. To a certain extent, I'd brought this upon myself because some time before this I had taken a little tab from some bikers who had double dipped that tab in some very very strong chemicals and although I was quite used to going on such mental adventures <laughs> this, this one did not go well and I had panic attacks for years and years and years, decades. And it wasn't until that I was in my 30s that I finally learned ways to deal with these panic attacks and not have to run out of buildings covered in sweat, not have to have all kinds of hours and hours of punishing thoughts and shame. And today, John Graham is going to share with us similar experiences that he's had and how that he's learned to deal with panic and anxiety. And he's done it really, really well because he's won the USA Memory Championship three times. He was recently on Chinese television where more people were watching him use his memory in real time than showed up to watch the Super Bowl. I mean, it's lots and lots of people. So if you can imagine the need to be able to not have panic or stress or anxiety in one of the most truly anxiety-inducing circumstances you can ever imagine, then you might want to know how somebody prone to anxiety attacks deals with that. I was certainly very interested, even though I found solutions for my own anxiety. And thank goodness, because it was life-destroying. I mean, I got by, but who wants to just scrape by when you can have so much joy and fulfillment? So John Graham is a wonderful source for information on how to deal with these things if you have them yourself. And I would have had such a much better journey as a university student if I hadn't had to deal with anxiety and panic on top of everything that was already anxiety inducing. But I didn't get these techniques in time. It was really near the middle of my PhD that I really started to hit on what works. And so that's what John and I talk about today. And before we get you to this amazing discussion with John, I just want to let you know very, very briefly that I am doing Victoria's Mind Live soon. And if you want to signal your interest, I've got a memory palace guided meditation for you. It's the happy memory palace guided meditation. And I heard from Mark recently about his experience. He said it was amazing. He went through it. You can see what he said on the screen. If I remember, he said that he was still tingling from the experience afterwards. So if you'd like to get that happy memory palace guided meditation, it's about really exercising your memory and finding a space of happiness. And it should help you calm down and have less anxiety if that you're in that sort of situation and you can listen to it again and again and again, but it's only for people who signal their interest in Victorious Mind Live. So go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VML for Victorious Mind Live if you would like to get that. And without further ado, listen to what John is suggesting and what we're talking about and really allow yourself to experiment with it. And I'll have a tip for you at the end that will make sure that you get the most out of these suggestions because there's, for many of us, a missing puzzle piece that not only is beneficial to know about, but it's a little bit challenging. And because it's challenging, it has been shown in studies, it's been shown in my own life, it's been shown in lots of people's lives, that if you can get this puzzle piece in place, it's precisely the challenge of it that makes it work so well and for the long term. So you don't want to miss that final word after this discussion with the great, the amazing, and super generous John Graham. John, good to see you. And we were just talking about what we're going to talk about and anxiety and overcoming these things. And it can be very difficult 
I think for people to see people like us, because I have had really bad anxiety and it's almost like impossible to tell because I just don't have it anymore. Or when I do, I have ways of dealing with it. And yourself, you're just coming back from China doing really a major thing in front of lots and lots of people. And you've had a history with anxiety and panic. How, how do you, where do we start with this conversation, especially given that we're sort of free from it and, you know, we want to reach and help people who are dealing with it in the thick of it now, who might just simply not believe us that, you know, it has been that in that intense. And I'm sort of sensitive to making a mockery of it because I laugh so much now and I, I feel almost recklessly free. So, you know, where do you think is the best place to begin in, in helping people who have panic, especially given all your accomplishments, the awards that you have, and it just, you know, you've, you've not only have you dealt with it, but you know, you've really been able to, to perform as a, as a memory athlete and as a presenter and just a gr all around great person. Yeah. I thank you for that. And I think talking about the show in China, the pinnacle moment, the show you're talking about had 400 million viewers. 400 million that's three times as many as the super bowl like it's just unfathomable because china's massive and who would go on a show with 400 million people are watching you when you're memorizing an insane amount of information i had to memorize 100 random items being placed in 100 random lockers memorizing the locker number mm. memorizing a four-digit code for each of the 100 lockers who would do that if you had panic attacks right you wouldn't do it <laughs> so you have to overcome something so mm. i share that story because it's it's proof that I've overcome something yeah. so deep, so paralyzing, right? Because that's what it is. Anxiety is just a lot of it's par paralysis. Panic is paralysis. And why do we shut down? Why do we have these embarrassing moments? And so that's important to share because someone who I was having at one point debilitating daily multiple panic attacks, like it was insane. It was scary. To the point where I thought I was, I thought I was going to die. Not, I knew I was going to die. Like when you're in that panic and that fear, that intensity, it's just unfathomable mm. to describe. Like it's, it's pure doom and gloom. And so I'm happy to share kind of where that started with me, some of the intense moments and, and really what I found to overcome it, because I think there's, there's levels of anxiety. Some people have anxious moments, you know, they get nervous for a test. Some people have that anxiousness feeling every single day they wake up you know that was me a heaviness shortness of breath you know stuck in your head overthinking um and then it goes all the way up to like panic or sheer feelings of doom and heart palpitations and feels like you're having a heart attack feels like you're having a stroke feels like you're going to die like something is wrong mm -hmm. so there's the gamut and i've experienced all of it um so yeah that, i think let's start there and I, i'd be happy to share where it started with me and, and how I figured it out. So this might be a weird question, but it's the one that comes to me. And it's one that I think helped me with my, my own anxiety in a roundabout way. Is What is it that's so bad about dying? I mean, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to ask this, but like, what's the big deal? Um, is yeah. it, it, I don't know. I don't know why that I feel like I need to ask that, but that to me seems like almost like if we're going to cut to the quick, like what is, what is the problem with that? <laughs> What's the problem? Well, that was my sheer terror was believing I was going to die. There were some issues that I had. I was diagnosed with a, a brain aneurysm, which didn't turn out to be anything serious, but just the thought of that sh shook my, shook me to my core. Right. And your worst fears come up. My worst fear is probably was fear of dying. And you're right. I've never been asked this question. So right now I'm trying to figure out how to answer this is <laughs> when you, it, it's all a belief. It's when you're attached to your life, your family, your money, your ha everything, right? You're so anchored into what you have there. There's a, there's an ability to have a massive amount of suffering. And you real you realize that when you hit the deepest depths of panic and anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. You're forced to confront that. What I mean by that is, you know, you see all of your attachments. Right. Atta you're like, the moment I feel like I'm going to die, the most important things in my life come to my forefront of my mind. I'm not worried about my schedule. 
my my money anymore. I'm not worried about certain things. It's like family, daughters, right? It comes to mind because you're going to lose them. So you realize, you notice how attached you are to things mm. in your life. And then when you're feeling like you're going to die, when you're going through this panic moments, you start questioning at all. Like, why am I holding so tightly to that money goal and that schedule and i have to work till five or six and and i have to achieve that even like a memory why, why am i so attached to having to win another championship and if i don't you know all of these things you start questioning yeah so you asking that question what's so fear of dying like you when you hit the depths you just start noticing every attachment you have and as you know those attachments cause can cause suffering if you're so controlling and attached to them in the way they need to be for you to be happy, it can cause a massive amount of control, which leads to anxiety, panic, all these nasty things. Yeah. Yeah, I think when we talk about attachments, I mean, there is perhaps the ultimate attachment is life itself, right? Like life wants to live. It's a biological reality. And maybe some people don't believe in materialism or material. They just want to deny all that stuff. But then at the end of the day, you would, you would, if you're having these kinds of issues, where else is it coming from? If it's not, you know, not that, uh, I mean, it's, it, this gets into like Zen in a way, but it's kind of like, you know, it's not like as if you do reality or you do life. It's like life does you. And so if that, machine isn't primed it's just not going to operate properly the engine is not going to take you down the street if it's if it's not tuned up or it's not going to take you down the street as well as it could if it's not tuned up so that's the breaking point right is believing you're in control of it all your body your mind your thoughts you're in control of everything which that's where the machine broke down for me is realizing there is a flow to life a massive flow that we don't have control of, that if we start merging with some of that, a lot of that, the more we merge with that, mm -hmm. the less attached we are to things, actually the happier we are internally because we stop trying to manipulate our, our environment, our world to make us happy. So is there something about being a nemonist that may make one a little bit more, I don't know, compelled to be a control freak? overall <laughs> i love that you said that yeah because that's the root of it all is the con the conditioning of control in the mind uh, that's an interesting question because i think yes most people who get into memory are more logical academic um, cognitive people who want to grab onto information hold on to it right that's a, there's a control in that like see all the books behind you if i could grab them all and put them in my brain that's a bit of you know force and mm. nothing wrong with that by the way no well, i hope not <laughs> but it's it's more of a left brain type of person who wants to remember more have more be more do more mm. those traits can certainly amplify anxiety for sure right. mm -hmm. so you mentioned having a, an episode that was this. I assume this was a hospitalization. What 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 happened? I had three times where I was. I went to the ER because I didn't know what was happening. Right. Really, just scary feeling of chest tightness, shortness of breath, feeling really dizzy, like you're going to pass out, and like that's really scary because you think, oh, I'm having a heart attack. You've never had a panic attack before. It's confusing. The thresh, the feeling between like a heart attack and a panic attack, they say can be very like almost identical. So you don't know. So ER visits happened a lot for me. Um, well, three, three times in a row, I would say. The, I got all the testing because I wanted to know what was going on. Because I didn't, I didn't know about panic attacks at the time. I didn't. Right. I thought there's something wrong with my heart. You know, I'm feeling palpitations. They test nothing wrong. One of the times I had a panic attack, my, the whole left side of my face went numb, completely numb. And I thought, oh, shit, I'm having a stroke, right? It wasn't a stroke. 
They tested my brain, they did the MRI, did the EKGs, the, the CAT scans, everything. So the hospitalization I talk about, the one I shared with the aneurysm, is they ran me under an MRI and they sent the result to my email, which I checked. And I'm going through a massive amount of anxiety at the time and panic. And I get this email that says, you have a brain aneurysm. <laughs> and without any doctor like comment, it's just like, here's your result. And that's the moment like all hell broke loose for me. And that's when I had my dark night of the soul. Cause I thought, you know, I was going to die. I was like, okay. I was like, I got this under control. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to like eat better. I'm going to do better. I'm going to make sure this thing doesn't pop in my brain. Mm. But then all I could think about was this thing. All I could think about was my daughters never being there for their high school graduations, things like that. And I started to try to control my anxiety. I started to try to control my blood pressure, control my, be relaxed. And that made things worse because any moment of resistance or fear or anxiety, I feared anxiety. I feared fear. And it's just like a phobia of it, yeah. which made it a really vicious cycle. And I went real down. I went downhill real fast. I was having daily, multiple panic attacks, just terror shooting through my veins. And do you have an aneurysm now or is it resolved? Yeah. So what happened was they, doctor was like, we should have never sent that out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because it, it was, it, it was technically an aneurysm because of the size of it. But he said, it's completely benign, harmless. Mm. It just, it was broke the threshold for, we need to look into this, but he showed me and it was a complete like, Hey, they should have never done that. Right. Okay. And so that goes along with my story is like, okay, well, John, you know, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you in my mind. Mm. So I was like, okay, I'm good. And then I started still having panic attacks. Even after that news, you're okay. I knew no heart attack. My heart's fine. Nothing wrong with my brain. Nothing wrong with me. And I'm still having them. Mm. Right. So even if you know there's nothing wrong, they can still run rampant. So I was still kind of in the doghouse, like, okay, what do I do with this? Well, I can relate. I've never, I've never received a medical notice like that, but I am and have been since I was very young a, a, a hypochondriac. So sometimes what I think about is like I've gotten so used to ignoring these little situations that have been diagnosed as panic or whatnot that I wonder which one I'm going to ignore that finally does me in. But that kind of gets me back to that kind of question because one of my panics that I had, I was for so much of my life, I was afraid of dying. And one day I remember coming out of a meditation and suddenly the fear of death was just gone and I noticed it. And it was just like, I feel so free from this. But then there's like the flip side of the coin, which is, you know, <laughs> there's just like another thing to worry about, which is like, oh, well, I didn't uh, pay attention to that signal. So now what happens if I wake up, you know, half my body is paralyzed or what have you. So it's almost like it never goes away. You, you have it one way, you have it the other way. And it's not like fear of death anymore, but now it's a fear of not dying. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I love that you bring this up because that was uh, in all of this, the way through it for me. And we can talk about what I did and everything, but when I started moving through this and releasing this resistance, this suppressed emotion, all of this junk inside of me, mm. I had my awakening. And we talked about a lot of it in the last podcast you and I did together. But I started not to fear death either. Right. Because I had a cosmic understanding. And I don't want to get into religion, all that. Everyone has their own beliefs. But like you have a, you have not just from an intellectual standpoint, I didn't read a book and like, oh, you know, I live on, whatever. I think we all kind of hear that in our head, but like you get a knowing through experiences you have spiritually that you can't explain, like you had, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden you have this inner knowing and a calm about, about death. Like, obviously, I don't want a knife up to my throat right now, and like, that would be scary, but like, I'm not afraid of it, like deathly afraid of it like I was before because I have a deeper mm. sense of awakening that happened because as a cattle, it happened because I went through 
this inner healing. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned the knife thing because I don't know about you, but I've studied a martial art and there's all kinds of fun things you can get up to in the dojo and so forth. But I'm well aware. I get hit on the head from the side or the back or even the front, you know, get a good shot in, you're done, you're done. Like it's, it's like all the training in the world is not necessarily going to translate in, into a situation depending what that situation is. And I don't want any of that trouble either, but it is something that I, you know, whenever that sort of history comes up, I always, you know, say to people, yeah, I got quite good at, at Sistema in the dojo, but just it doesn't mean anything outside of it really and i hope i never have to although i did have a situation and luckily the particular training helped me relax in a situation of threat mm. and i think that's one of the benefits of of doing these kinds of exercises and dealing with your stress is that if you ever are unfortunately like i was um mugged in new york uh or, well actually it wasn't mugged i don't know what you call it when someone tries to mug you, but you actually manage to escape. Uh, it's but, a casual encounter in New York. Right? Yeah. <laughs> An everyday situation. But, you know, he had, a, he had his hand in his pocket and he was going like this. It could have been his finger, but you don't know. Right. And he's just like, give me all your money or I'm going to shoot you. And because of this training and I'd just been in so many situations, like they're, they're, um, they're play situations, really, at the end of the day in, in Sistema. But actually, Sistema is a little bit more intense because we have uh, blunt knives and we do things with chairs and chains and like all this stuff. So we practice trying to emulate as much as possible the most stressful thing you would ever go through. Anyway, because of all that, I was just able to relax. And I remember that guy saying, get that smile off your face. But that's what I was trained to do, shoulders down and so forth. And I think that that comes up too, just in terms of, when I speak with people, sometimes I speak with people about memory training and I'm just pretty fearless about saying, look, you can be that one person who dies on the hill that your brain is different, or you can be the person who's going to uh, use common sense and just pick up a pencil and draw a memory palace or what have you. But that fearlessness comes from training to reduce uh, the stress of you uh, never know when it's going to come up, you know, that you're confronted. I love that because that's how I overcame part of it how I overcame it is when you're in anxiety, like you and I were panic, whatever you're unconsciously conditioned to react a certain way. Mm. And so unpeeling that conditioning is exactly what you're talking about for you. It's staying relaxed, shoulders down. It's the same thing. Like throughout your day, I made sure, and this is part of it, that I'm relaxed at all times, even if I'm in a deep, anxiety even if i'm in a deep frustration or whatever negative emotion spiral i'm in mm. to stay relaxed through it and to be in that storm instead of trying to escape out of it like we're unconsciously trained trained to like grab our phone the moment we're uncomfortable or go for a walk the moment we're uncomfortable or go work out the moment we're uncomfortable mm. you trained that too you trained yourself to stay relaxed in moments that allowed you to do that and that's exactly what i did too is you have to recondition that programming of tension and control and force right. to unwind it. Well, I want to talk about some of these strategies, but do you have any idea or have you ever done an analysis or, I mean, I'm not trying to, uh, to get a stick here, but do you have any uh, idea of what would, st what would still rattle your cage? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you mess with my daughter, sure. Um, right. Yeah. Like as far as fear or just to rattle me? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, part of the question that I have around it is some some sort of knowledge of, of what may be coming. I guess it's a stoic thing, you know, like to, to imagine all the bad potential things in the morning that could happen during the day, you're sort of defanging the, the snake before it has a chance to arise. So... Yeah. I, I was just kind of curious, well, especially, I, I mean, I, let me contextual. I'm talking to the guy who wins these memory competitions and goes mm -hmm. to China to do it on TV, yeah. you know, it's like, so have you done an analysis of like all that can go wrong so that you're prepared in advance or is it just better to just be relaxed? I mean, it's funny you say that when it comes to memory training, you know, you and I had a podcast a few years ago on the chaos training that I do. Mm. So all of the bad experiences I've had in memory 
came up naturally in memory competitions where the mic was bad and I couldn't hear what I was memorizing and it caused all this, you know, fear and anxiety. Oh shit, I'm going to lose or, you know, a mistake that was made. Um, even last year, uh, when I won, I don't know if people know this, but 2023, the cards were two decks of cards. It was a jumbo deck shuffled in with a regular deck. Oy. So like, and I read two cards at a time. So I had this massive number nine and like a small ace and I'm trying to read them together. And that, you know, that threw a wrench in. They didn't tell you they right? were going like, to do that? No, no. It just kind of happened. You know? Just the eye so, refocusing must have been intense, like in terms of energy drain and all that stuff. I don't know. I was <laughs> I, at that point because of my chaos training and, you know, I train for this stuff. I'll like do push ups before my training. I'll put a podcast full blast in my ear while mm -hmm. I'm memorizing instead of training in quiet to, to prepare for this moment. Like, right. because I don't want anything. I don't want Tony's voice to get in my ear, like, because he likes to talk a lot in these memory competitions. If you watched it, I don't want anything to rattle me. I, if someone walked in and yelled fire, like I've, convince myself keep memorizing mm. you know because i prepared so i don't know if there's anything around me i'm sure there's something i could get under but the training would kick in of like you know come back to it mm. come back to what you're focused on right, right. well what did, what what are some of the things that you started to do to recondition to use that that term that you used that sounds mm -hmm. a much a much a more interesting term than decondition recondition decondition yeah like I talked about, you have to stay, anxiety thrives in a tense body. Like you have to understand where this comes from. This at the root of it is our, all this suppressed emotion. Like every single thing you have ever pushed away internally in your whole life is still in here. Mm -hmm. And when people realize that it makes sense, like this stuff is coming up to be felt, to be seen, to be experienced. We just keep like, scrolling on our phones or running away from our demons or not knowing how to confront that, right? So we have to stay relaxed and allow that stuff up, right? That's part of it, what I shared. Knowing this, you have to also have a regulated nervous system. You know, I'm sure you get this. A lot of people want to hack their brains, yeah. remember more. Brain, it's like brain hack, brain hack, brain hack. Well, your brain is a part of a nervous system. Like there's brain cells in your knees. You have a nervous system that runs throughout your whole body. And that nervous system has to be fully regulated for you to be able to handle the day. And by handle it, I mean like process the emotions as they're going through instead of burying everything and feeling like you're a tense ball of fire. Right. So when I learned that, I, I was like, I literally laid in bed or couch bed, laid down flat for 30 minutes a day to, to just let go of all this tension to activate my parasympathetic nervous system to make sure I was fully regulated so that I could handle stress. Stress meaning all this suppressed emotion that's in my cells and my nervous system. Yeah, that's interesting. I've often thought that the biggest mistake adults do is they get rid of nap time. I mean, <laughs> one of my fondest memories of elementary school, I, I think mm -hmm. they stopped it in grade three or something. Or maybe grade two. I remember my earliest memory anyway is every day they would have this time and they would say, roll out your mats and just lay there, you know? <laughs> and I don't recall whether I went to sleep or not, but at the end of the day, there was always this pause period time to just chill, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's just something that you got to basically study yoga as an adult or whatever to, to learn it again. Yeah, but it is powerful. Yeah. I think people know this too. They know they should relax and nap, but they don't. You know, I was very wound up in my mind all the time. I always felt like I had to be productive. I got to be doing something. Even if I'm sitting here watching a movie, I'm thinking in my head, planning the next day or planning my next business move or prepare, like going through flashcards from my memory palace or something, you know, like I'm doing something right. and that's very harmful to our nervous system. And our. I'm sure people who have anxiety who are listening to this feel drained. You feel really tense in your neck or your forehead or like your chest it's because of that you know and i was the same way as we know we should relax we know we shouldn't eat junk food but we still do these things so why right right man. well do you know why is there any parts of the puzzle yeah. yeah i mean it's to pacify all the energy we can't handle 
right? The energy, meaning you talk, this suppressed emotion that's in your body, all of us have it, mm. is trying to escape. It wants out. It wants to be seen and felt. And it's not all coming up at the same time, but it comes up. It gets poked, right? And so if you have something poke you, bother you, it tries to come up. And we don't even realize it, but it's so uncomfortable sometimes or slightly uncomfortable that we pacify that uncomfortable feeling with you can do anything, video games, food, phone, porn, um, any addiction, anything, working out, blowing off steam. These are all ways to vent that energy is to, to avoid it, to escape it. So when you realize that, that we're all doing this, we're all escaping these uncomfortable, even if it's boredom, an intent, uh, an uncomfortable energy and emotion. That's what we're doing. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I spontaneously just asked this question, you know, well, what's the problem with dying, but laying down flat on your back in yoga has a name. It's Shavasana and Shavasana in English is usually called corpse pose. Like literally <laughs> a corpse pose. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called. I mean, you're practicing dying. You're getting ready for that pose. And... I wish I was so clever to come up with stuff like that. I mean, I, <laughs> I'd be living in a castle if I was that clever. But that that is literally what they call it uh, in English, corpse pose. Uh, That's so, ironic. Yeah. That's yeah. ironic. Yeah. To get over a fear of death, you have to practice corpse pose. That's kind of what I'm saying, right? Yeah. In a way, indirectly. Okay. Well, that's one thing. Did Is that it? Yeah. That solved it? Or That's it. You just saw, sit down, lay down for 30 minutes a day. Huh? I mean, well, that's I, the number one. That's a must is hmm. you have to regulate your nervous system. And, you know, a bath is okay. Um, massage is okay, but it doesn't get to the root of it all. Right. So I figured out laying flat. And I, I walk people through this in a guided track. It's not meditation or anything like that. You're not. You're not trying to force yourself to focus on anything because then that's your controlling mind. Um, fully regulated nervous system. Being able to handle any single moment of the day, any single time you're having an experience of uncomfortable negative emotion. Like relax. I have this process called unhooking to allow it to move through you. You want that out because... You don't want it trapped in there. So we don't want to be tense and keeping that stuff in and escaping. Because if you escape it, you're bypassing that energy and you're storing it. So staying relaxed throughout all parts of the day. Not just for your 30-minute meditation in the morning and your 30-minute meditation at night. Like all day. Mm -hmm. Any moment that's frustrating, annoying, sad. You allow that to happen. And that's hard. You know? Our initial reaction is to escape, right? Go on the phone. Blow steam. So that's the second thing. And the third thing that I did was that I figured out on my own is, you know, <laughs> I have a funny name for it. I call it catalyst integration. It's basically, it sounds complex. It's basically taking those boulders of the past that are still haunting you. The people, the things, the experiences. People can call it trauma. You can call it whatever you want. And how do you release that energy, that ball of energy that's inside of you? You know, because I had an experience, and it's ironic. I'm a three-time memory champion. I don't remember if we talked about this on the last podcast. My grandfather, and the story of how I discovered this, this forgiveness. But um, yeah, I had a big ball of rage inside of me that I released one day. And it was profound, like a literal elephant of rage lifted off of my shoulders. And I didn't know what happened. Mm. Like, it felt so heavy, so dark. And in 10 seconds, I lifted it. And it was gone forever. I had tried to get it back because I was like, well, not because I wanted it, but I was like, what just happened? Okay. So I figured out how to take all these boulders, these inside of me and, and start releasing them. So that I felt lighter, so that I didn't have this suppressed energy inside of me or gumming me up, uh, always feeling poked by life, right? To cause this anxiety. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point. And I think it comes up a lot in my experience of the memory training world, which I think that 
you know, some of the reason why people say, oh, but my brain works different and I'll never be able to do it mm -hmm. is I, I wonder if they're not intuiting that kind of responsibility that comes from quote unquote mastering your memory. So you just said, you know, well, it's ironic. I've won all these competitions, but I can't remember whether I told you this thing or not. And, you know, I think you did tell me about your grandfather before, but I don't distinctly remember whether the camera was on or, or, or it wasn't. But there right. is, there is that you just take on something if you're going to be a memory person, which is that it's it's always going to have this irony that you're like the flash. I mean, you can show up on time when the car is flipped over and the gasoline is rolling all over the street and people are going to be exploded in a, if you don't get there on time. But remembering your date with your girlfriend, I mean, that's just not what the flash does. You know, he forgets all this sort of stuff. He has, he has like this real life. I, I just wonder, you know, how how can how can we reconcile that? Just to stick in the memory world for a second, you know, how 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 do people reconcile that? Because I think a lot of people are scanning this. They see we in the memory world actually not remembering stuff all the time, using phrases like "I forget," "Oh heaven forbid," and then it's just like, well, they can't be that good. If uh, you know, how can we still encourage oh, them sure, to, sure. to to learn the memory techniques anyway? You know, yeah. Well, it's like Michael Jordan missed more shots than all you guys, and he's the best player. I forget more than every single person listening to this podcast mm. because I have to know the art of forgetting just like the art of remembering, right? you know? And so, yeah, I think it's funny. I think it's I'm human because I filter like everyone. I think you should filter all the information that comes in. You, I am not sitting here memorizing every fact and figure and footnote of life like that's you can't. It's, it's just overwhelming. And that's only going to give you more anxiety. It's going to put you in your head. Yeah. And so I filter like anyone else. And if I don't need to remember it or it's not important or I can figure it out later, you know, why need to? If I need to turn on my memory switch, I will. Yeah. But it's funny. I was, uh, you know, talking about the show in China. I'm about ready to record the show. Like I'm getting there in the morning, walking across the street to go into the building. 400 me million people are going to watch a show. I better be on. And this woman who worked there was escorting me in because I had to go through security. And I asked her, hey, what's your name? And she goes, John, you met me yesterday. Right. And I, here I am about to do this big memory feed, be focused. And I forgot that I met this woman yesterday. And then to my defense, she had glasses and a different coat on that day. But anyway, it's we're human. We're human. <laughs> that's no excuse john come on no. <laughs> no but it's it is it is this irony and i face it pretty much every day and you know people will say you're supposed to be some memory expert why do you read from a teleprompter and it's because like, i'm busy memorizing sanskrit not something that i'm going to discuss once you know like <laughs> mm -hmm. should i now comment on your iq <laughs> uh, i just don't answer those ones but i do we're just make punching bags for these memory jokes and yeah right, right, i get right. it I've accepted it. I roll with it. It's all good. But that does raise a question in my mind that I don't know the answer to, actually, because I've never asked you. But there always seems to be an aversion to getting into the shop. Like, you don't really want to teach mnemonics. And we'd much rather talk about high order things. And I think people would understand why. Like, oh, you got the solution for panic and anxiety? Cool. Why would we talk about the major system? Right. But I wonder, do you think you? Like, is it a, a deliberate strategy not to teach mnemonics because it would create panic and anxiety in some way, or is it something else? Like for me personally, why do I focus on this instead of memory? Yeah, because yeah. you know, if you were going to be in 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 the business of it, you you would have all the street cred that you need, you know. Uh, oh yeah, but you don't. I used and, to be. While well, talking about this, I used to be the number one Google result for memory coach at least in America, Google memory result, a memory coach. And I was number one. And, and I gave that up right. because I wanted to help people with I what I thought was more important things, you know, because hacking your mind and memory and all this stuff is really, really cool. Obviously I took it really, really far and I'm still competing. Right. I love it. Mm. But the richness of life and the experience I've been through, like helping people overcome the demons, the panic, the mental health, the emotional health. It's a no brainer of what's more important and enjoyable for, for me. Right. Um, 
as far as I satisfaction. Just, I was just curious because, you know, I myself avoid teaching certain things. I may change and I'm sort of probably going to change, but I'm so stressed out about people getting the wrong idea about what I say when I talk about meditation and then how it starts to seem mystical and I'll say things that are in that mystical realm. But it gives me nightmares to think that somebody might, well, they do, they already do interpret it incorrectly, but I deliberately have delayed going hook, line, and sinker into memory and meditation just simply because I, I don't want to have thoughts. So then if I'm having thoughts about you know what has already been interpreted by people that I'm not actually saying, but I can take responsibility uh -huh. for them interpreting it that way. So anyway, that's, I just wondered if you were, had a deliberate strategy to avoid causing yourself the stress that comes with the responsibility of teaching memory techniques, knowing that they're not bulletproof as such, except for that they can be in certain circumstances. And, you know, you know. Well, I have an answer maybe you're not expecting, but what comes to mind is that that's sort of like the control, the control of the mind, right? You talked about being afraid of what people, confusing what you're saying, right? And so it's like, it's a waste of my time because everyone's like pointing little exceptions to your rules, right? Right, right. And that's, that, that's sort of like, in my experience, an anxious mind is always like pre-planning out, pre-thinking about all the scenarios that could go wrong or what you had to worry about and then trying to fix them ahead of time because our mind wants to be in control of that, have everything figured out. And that causes all this anxiety, right? Um, okay. On the other hand, triggering people they hear you and you're like that's wrong or they get angry or whatever reaction they have mm. has nothing to do with you i know we know that intellectually but when you really realize that that's what saved me it's like if i make anthony upset because of something i said or some person comments and they're triggered bothered angry at what i say it has nothing to do with me it has to do with their suppressed emotion, their conditioning that got hit, that got poked. Mm -hmm. And so if I see one, someone who's bothered or angry or frustrated or like annoyed by what I said, I'm gifting them a poke. You see what I'm saying? Like a poke is good. If you poke someone like not intentionally, I don't want you to go poking people like trying to agitate them. But if you're speaking your truth, sharing what you know, trying to do the best you can and it hit, poke someone, you're gifting them something to work through whether they work through it or not yeah, okay right because everything that poked me was the gateway for my healing when i realized everything that's poking me is not out to get me it's they're poking me because it's like hey poke it or like move through this mm -hmm. right instead of run away from this so okay. i gave you a way deeper answer than you probably thought but it's I, related I I, I am interested in going as deep as we can possibly go. Um, but but it kind of comes back to a thing that we always get into, <laughs> which is, you know, so this is happening. You've got this gift and, you know, the, maybe there's some meaning behind it. Like that's the way it was supposed to happen. And for me, it just creates more anxiety when I think oh, there's some meaning behind all of this, because clearly <laughs> whatever things are poking me that cause me to go, left, right, center, up and down is always just as like leading into more potentially controversial areas and so forth. So, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that there's a meaning or purpose behind things I find just pushes me back into it. Uh, uh, maybe not an anxiety, but more yeah. bottled rage against injustices of various belief systems and so forth. Not, yeah. not merely the ones I grew up in, but just that they're there at all. And I, I know you see that a little bit differently but that just sort of raises the question, like, how do you deal with it? That there are. You get out of your mind. Yeah. It's just that's it all. Be. Like you said, the mind. Yeah. It's that easy. Get out of the mind. <laughs> the mind gives everything meaning. Every single thing that you see, we label it, put it in a box, categorize it, give it a meaning. We do that unconsciously or consciously. And that's what's causing our anxiety and all this panic is that control of the mind to label and box and and there's nothing wrong with the mind mm. but to resolve this we have to let go we have to release that mind 
right? release just like what i was laying i'm releasing control of my body i'm releasing control of my mind i'm not trying to force my thoughts i'm not trying to shut off my mind that's all control we have to release this and that's a new reconditioning is when you're in anxiety and you're in panic you have an over dominant mind you try to do everything with this mind when we need to let go of some of that and bring that into harmony because otherwise you're going down those rabbit holes and you're ne- you're going to spiral out so you would suggest then or are you in agreement with my intuition that even it was meant to be has to be let go of if it is part of creating an anxiety or would you prefer that people come to accept that there maybe is a, an order I mean, hmm. I, I mean i'll that's an interesting question i believe everything is meant to be hmm. but i don't label it and i don't try to figure out every reason why but i know because you, you know people must think these nasty things that happen to us these unfortunate things must be there can't be a possible reason for this. Why would why would God, why would the universe give that to us? But when I was in the depths of my anxiety and panic, I realized some of those, like all those worst fears, those moments I went through were gifts because I hit that wall and I was forced to change. I was forced to see things differently. I was forced to feel through things and I'll release stuff that like changed my life. So, um. I believe personally that everything is happening for some reason. Just our mind likes to categorize that's a bad reason. That's a good reason. Right. right? There's no good or bad. Mm. Just is. Right. Okay. Um, I, I'm just I'm curious both for myself and just for others, because you know, some people they they would say, well, I, I don't know if I could do that if 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 there's going to be a cult at the end of it, you know, that sort of thing, which I know there isn't, but uh, right. it always seems that way. And especially in these times, right? Because we're in, a, in increasingly scientific certainty about a lot of things. Not that there is certainty, but the data is just kind of, this is what it is, you know, and, and there is no outside of this that's somehow guiding it or whatever i mean there's the laws of physics and that's it and as we have become more and more scientific it seems that we have become more and more political and then politics by definition is should you know mm-hmm. and then it should be this way it's and it's not so now let's uh crank all this up together so it's like mind 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 all mind yeah. as opposed to letting go, letting it be, et cetera. But then it's like, let it go into what? And that's where- uh, That's where the mind gets in is like, your mind is thinking, what do I, what do you mean by this? How do I, what are the steps? Like, what do you mean should, what do you mean let go? You know, and that again, that's what we, we can't solve anxiety, panic, even like paranoia, anything with the mind because the mind is what's conditioning it all. So we can't, have all these mental techniques to solve this stuff because it's not going to work. It's limited. Mm. So to what extent do you think that your success with this, if at all, is related to memory training? Or is it possible to reach this equanimity? Mm -hmm. I'm having this moment. I think it's called jamais vu where equanimity seems very unfamiliar to me all of a sudden and then i'm just like is that what that means anyway but you reach the state of you know being able to deal with things and and not be sort of stressed out i just wonder if you would credit memory training at all or is it possible for somebody to reach a similar state without a memory training background or memory exercise i have a thesis but i i, I don't know the answer yeah i mean i've i've helped a large number of people without memory training to to achieve this but i also on my story absolutely there's parts of memory training that have helped me not so much the left-brained part of it the structure the memory palace the thinking all of that but the right brain the more intuitive the more creative what i mean by that is 
when you're in anxiety, when you're in the mind, you're always trying to control, contain, figure out. Figure out is a good way to say it, right? Which mm -hmm. causes a lot of issues. When you're in your right brain or when you're in your heart or when you're in the moment, like truly, stuff comes to you out of nowhere. Insight, intuition, creativity, ideas. Like, And so training my memory, I always allowed the first thing to come to my mind that I could use to link or memorize something. I called it the inkblot method. I'm sure we've talked about this. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, years ago on a podcast. It rings a bell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I trained myself to trust the first thing that came to my mind to use in a connection or an image or whatever, a nostalgia to memorize something instead of searching my mind for the perfect image. Notice the difference. Mm. Notice my left brain wants to the perfect answer, the, the control of like, I need this. No, this isn't going to work. That's that. Well, this will work. No, it'll work better if I use this, right? All this time is wasted, all this control. That's the left brain. That's the anxious mind. The right brain, I wouldn't even say the right brain. I would say the heart. Allows something to come through. From where? I don't know, but I trust it. And I've done really well. Hmm. By allowing this stuff to come in. So that part of me is very, very helpful okay. when you're trying to retrain, to let go of the mind, to trust, because I know I can trust it. I know I can trust the moment to know what decision to make in a moment without analyzing every gear and scenario. Right. Yeah, that's, that's great stuff. And I myself would say that whether whether memory training is useful or not, there's there's probably got to be some kind of meditative training, even if it's just, you know, death pose or corpse pose. Um, uh, the, but the, the, the puzzle always is, and it sort of just comes back to things we've already talked about, is, you know, like, people know to do this. And, and why is it that they still persist in not doing it and I don't know that there's an answer to it, and I don't know if there's even a question about why it is that way, but it's it it seems like we're in cynical times also, because everything has just become, you know, internet content, marketing. Like there's no content that isn't marketing, because even if we do a free thing, there's gonna be ads run against it from some corporation and all that sort of stuff. So it's just kind of you know, I don't know. I I mean, I, I kind of don't even know what to say about it anymore. It's it's just such a it's just become such a weird thing. Maybe it was always weird, and it, it, there is a weirdness that that was always there because humans have had to trade clamshells forever. But you know, it's just like uh, yeah. Well, there's more of a instant gratification. Mm -hmm. What is instant gratification? You're chasing a feeling, right? Or if we're getting to the root of it, yeah. we're always chasing a feeling. So what's happening is, you know, like take the example, when you have anxiety, that's a feeling you don't want. So you escape to a feeling that's better. We always try to feel better or avoid something that feels bad. Every single decision you've ever made or today was to feel better or to not feel bad. Think about that. It's crazy. But that's what we're doing. And so if you're sitting there and you want to be better, you want the long-term goal, you want the thing, but then you're feeling anxious or frustrated or annoyed or any type of bored or like anything. You try to escape that to feel a little bit better. So you get online, you scroll on your phone, this makes me feel a little bit better. That's what's happening is our feelings are hijacked. Mm. And so the people who are going to move through anxiety, like myself, like yourself, are going to understand that. And they're going to be start noticing how they're feeling and they're going to start allowing that to happen instead of always trying to manipulate it or hack their way to a better feeling right or go on a run or go go to the bar to blow off steam like not that anything's wrong with those things but when you understand all you're trying to do is feel better and bury those whoa <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. But that's what's happening well, I, I'm glad you took it that way because that seems to me the, like the crux of it, right? Is that we're, it's an increasingly cybernetic world where there is no escape. Like the, the escape is the escape 
or the escape is the prison because <laughs> you're now going to go from the, the app to the to the other app sort of thing as opposed mm-hmm. to to getting out into the world sitting being a physical unit again so there's 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 the paradox right like how 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 does that person get out of it like you have to almost intellectualize it and then your intellectualizing power has to be strong enough that it prompts the body to go into pain essentially to go to go to recondition by going into the place that it it doesn't want to go so yeah yeah you it's a decision and you'll revert back you'll make mistakes you'll go binge watch something or go back to old habits patterns like we all do but for me i can speak to myself and some of the people i worked with is yeah the people that move through it make a decision because they understand like what i just said if you understand the truth everything you've ever pushed away is still inside of you and for that to release it will release as pain and discomfort because it's emotional pain it's it's going to feel painful to move through it to allow it to move up. Right. So if you know that, then you're like, for me, I was like, okay, I understand this. I'm going to be uncomfortable. It's going to get out. But I don't want it inside of me. It's causing all these issues. When I knew that, understood that, I was like, okay, I made a decision. And I said, any single time I'm having a panic moment, like when I was releasing them, anxiety, discomfort, I reframed it as like spiritual growth or emotional growth, whatever you want to call it. It's a good thing because we got to label it bad. So I labeled it a good and I convinced myself and I remember that every day. Through that decision, it allowed me to to walk through those fires. Yeah, I think that is a a good word for it, decision or a good imperative, uh, not just a word. I just, uh, I wonder, how do you, like, where do you think it all goes? You know, like, because we have to repeat the process over and over and over again. Like, it's not like you get to, it's it's basically a gym, right? You're going to lose your muscles if, uh, if you don't keep working out. So how do you, once you've made that decision, how do you, how do you, so, so solidify in your mind that you're going to be able to keep making the decision like yes you'll backslide and go and spend a week watching the series mm-hmm. or whatever but you know is is there another strategy or is it just the same strategy that has to be the, made over and over again or does it get more nuanced and deep it gets better that's when you know it's working right because we all want to know it's working mm. once you know it's working you have less panic less anxiety and starts really really lightening and dissipating you don't have the dread and the heaviness anymore you keep going but the reason i keep going is it's part of me now like i know i'm a human being and i will continue to feel angry and feel fear and feel whatever at moments in my life like you all even someone who's enlightened feels that stuff right it doesn't mean that they're in bliss all the time it's like they understand it's a fleeting moment it moves through you right but what i can't really uh describe is like the expansion you get because intellectually i i can't explain this intellectually because it's beyond the mind right when you expand when you start absorbing all of these um uh, my mentor calls them codes like all these suppressed energies inside of you when you crack that open when you see it when you feel it when you allow it to pulse through your body you you sort of upgrade the intelligence of your DNA of your body knows what to do. Just like your body right now is pumping blood and doing all these hormones and excretions and everything without even your mind knowing what to do, there's a supreme intelligence behind this. And so when you keep expanding, you keep getting these codes. Mm. And you see things differently. Your perspective is more whole, you're more integrated, you're more embodied. You're more at peace, like things you can't even describe intellectually. And so you just keep expanding as a human being. Mm. You mentioned mentor. How important is that for you? Oh, yeah. Everyone needs a mentor. Mm. Like, especially find someone who is at the level you want to be and, oh, well, hey, how are you doing it? And then listen and follow them. Yeah. I've always 
had, whether it's memory or business or anxiety, panic, I've always had people help me move through that. Yeah. People who've been through it myself. Yeah. Yeah, I asked because I went two years, I think, without a mentor, which is very unusual. And I don't know exactly why that I did that, but it was a bad idea. <laughs> you know, not mm -hmm. not having that regular contact with an external mm -hmm. source that 100% sees things that you're outside of your perspective and can point things it's out. The, it's so the best investment you can make. It's not in gold. It's not in Bitcoin. No. It's in you. Right. So yeah. find a mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an odd thing too, right? I mean, we already talked about it in a different way, but people will invest more in their house insurance than in, in themselves or more in in some ethereal energy-based asset than they will in, in the actual experience of this body here, this psychological, emotional experience right now. And often those external investments just create more and more anxiety as opposed to reducing it because they're worldly things as opposed to experiential worldly. things. Not that experience isn't worldly, but you know what I'm saying? It's a, yeah. it's a different realm. Yeah. Of if you're world. looking, yeah. If you're looking for happiness and anything outside of you, money, trophies, house, women, whatever mm. you're, it's not sustainable and it's not the reason you're happy. Right. Remove all the junk. And you'll feel happy. Um, Michael Singer talks about this, the author. I'm going to go see him in a few days <clears throat> in Florida. Right. But he said, a white line, the white line on the side of the road, you know, just the traffic line, the line that, so you don't veer off track. He said that line can give you as much happiness as a million dollars or whatever you want. And people think that's crazy. But the happiness is inside of you. It's an energy. And if you remove all this stuff, this junk, distortion, friction, resistance, it's there. You can tap into it. You can yeah, bliss yeah. out looking at a line versus seeing a millionaire completely depressed because that money has nothing to do with your happiness and well-being. Yeah, I haven't heard that one from Singer, but I, I remember walking around Berlin after I first really got into adding breathing to my meditation and mm -hmm. just looking at the dirt on a road sign. I was just like, wow, <laughs> it was the most amazing thing to me all of a sudden. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, mud splashes up from a truck and, you know, this way is to Stieglitz or wherever, whatever dire whatever sign it was. I think it was to, in the direction of Stieglitz. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoa, so fascinated. I hadn't taken any drugs. I don't even think I'd had any coffee yet that morning. And it was just like astonishing. And you, it's like, it's weird, but you can build it. You can build exactly that thing where the, the street is more fascinating than driving on it in a, yeah. In a way. So. Yeah. 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 Because the, what he says is like million dollars, women, house, the guy, the perfect guy, whatever relationship, those are all preferences. Mm -hmm. Those are all me in my mind, my conditioned mind thinking when I have that, I will feel good. Right. Called attachment, called a preference. He calls them preferences. So if you remove all of your preferences, and you release all the stuff that bothers you, you're good. If it's storming outside on your birthday, if there's traffic jam, if you get, you know, in a car accident and you're okay, like you're good. You're good. Yeah. Do you think so the I, transformation, how fast can the transformation happen? How, how fast was it for you? Yeah. Um, I get asked this a lot. I was having daily, so we're talking panic attacks. Mm. I was having daily multiple panic attacks. And then I found out I was fine. And I was still having daily multiple panic attacks. When everything clicked. And I started practicing what I teach now to my students. It took about two months before I got rid of all my panic attacks. And I, I don't even like to say got rid of them. But got rid of all that stuff to not have any more panic attacks. And I was like, oh, I'm good. I'm in the clear. I solved this. And then. Two or three months later, I had a panic attack in the middle of a movie theater. And I was like, oh, shit, I failed. Like, it's all like whatever. And then that was about a year ago. I haven't had anything since. Um, and felt you feel a lightness and you feel even like anything that bothers you. Just, oh, it's just a thing. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, being in front of 400 million people, I thought that would test me. I thought surely there's something to come up. And, you know, 
I was able to handle that. So for me, about two months of devoting myself to this, and then this last flare-up happened a couple months later, and I was good. And a, a report similar to the people that I work with is like, man, if your nervous system is regulated like fully, that's most of the work. And then reconditioning how you handle bad moments of the day instead of escaping them if you know what to do in those moments you're going to release a lot of this pressure that's inside of you this steam right. very quickly yeah yeah that's good i mean i had a similar thing it was pretty fast uh and then there were subsequent ep episodes but uh luckily i read a lot about these so-called enlightened people and it turns out that a lot of them were notorious for throwing people out of their ashrams <laughs> So, I mean, whether they were enlightened or not, they were still human. They, they still got irritated. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think part of the part of the why I think about it is just to just to avoid false goals. Yeah. So many people put. It's good to have goals. Don't get me wrong, but time limits on their goals or yeah expectations. Yeah. yeah. You know, just chatting with somebody about you know how one of my courses didn't help with native fluency, and I'm like, well, Sefer. You know the uh, European standard by which you are progressively taken through levels of proficiency in a language. They don't require native fluency. Uh, all they require is that you're able to be able to put a little bit of shade and emphasis in your sentences in order to give them more nuance and meaning. But the, it, it, uh, accentedness is the term that they use there. It, 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 Trying to get rid of accentedness is a false goal. And as memory people, especially in memory science, we would know this because you have implicit memory and you have procedural memory and you have all kinds of things with uh, echoic memory and auditory memory, blah, 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 down. Like it's, it's memory all the way down, not turtles, but memory. <laughs> you know, so it's just, a, it's just a, yeah, native fluency. That's an admirable goal. But actors who pull off accents often do it for sentences that are, you know, with their coaches around while the, the camera is running. And then as soon as they say cut, well, you don't see the, uh, the 50 takes that, <laughs> that it didn't sure, work on. Sure. You know? So this is a, a false goal. Problem. And I think we just have a lot of false goals and it's important to, um, to be aware of, of that habit, that tendency, because that's more mental control. <laughs> Again, the, the, the mental conditioning. Exactly. Yeah. It's very, automated in us to have that. Yeah. I would agree a hundred percent. So what's coming up next with your projects? You, you, you mentioned, you know, the, the mystery and the puzzle of why you would be compelled to go and compete again. Do you have plans or ideas or are you just chilling? Yeah. I want to compete and win a fourth. Um, cause I enjoy it. I enjoy the journey of it. And I want Nelson Dallas to come out of retirement because if I win a fourth title, you know, he's got five. He's going to maybe come back. So he's a good friend of mine. I want him to come back. So I'll be competing later this year at the U.S. Championship. Um, but yeah, now I work with people uh, who want to overcome their panic attacks for good, not just manage them and, you know, have all these tactics that manage and maintain anxiety, but to really get to the core root the mental conditioning and also the suppressed emotion so i share those three techniques that we talked about very much in a deeper way and because i know that if you do them the right way that this stuff just processes through and you feel free of it uh, which people deserve like i i know how many people are suffering now um, but i have a i have a program it's eight weeks it's guided through me and and some simple modules to, if you're interested to go to releasepanic.com and all the information's there too on the format. But for people who don't want to just go through it on their own and read a book and, you know, hope it works, which I tried all that stuff too. It's, it's better to have someone who can mentor and guide you through someone who's done it for themselves and for others and understands where they're at and what they're really experiencing. Um, it's terrifying. Um, and you don't need to live in that anymore. Yeah, well, I'd say jump on it because I've been through some pits of anxious hell and it's it's not worth being in. So releasepanic.com, you say? Yep. Beautiful, beautiful URL. Uh, 
it's, it's hard these days to find uh, find a good one. <laughs> I know it came beautifully. So I'm like, yeah. what's the opposite of? I mean, that's what the program is called released. Because mm-hmm. when you have control, you're holding on tight. To let go, you you have to release. You have to release the conditioning. You got to release the suppressed emotions. How do we do that? It's not as simple as we think. But yeah, the URL is meant to be. You know, talking about meant to be and everything happening for a reason. It was meant to be. Well, maybe one day we can collaborate on a on a book where we we call it meant to be, and then we go through the various. No, I don't even want to spend the time on the intellectual noodling because I already know. I know it's not a solvable puzzle. <laughs> No, thank but, you. <laughs> I always, uh, I always want to collaborate with you in some way, and here we are collaborating on this conversation. So, thank you as always for for sharing your experience and these processes that have helped you so much, and for letting us know about releasepanic.com. Yeah, it's my pleasure to to be real and raw and honest with people to know that they're not alone, and it's a it's a very no one talks about it. If they have it, right? So I want to, I got a solution here. I'm not afraid of it. And always glad to share with you, Anthony, because you're very open and willing to have a conversation, which you got a great audience too. You got people who really care about achieving and and doing well. So I really want to help because I get a lot of comments from you listeners. I get emails from you listeners. If you're, you know, listening to this, um, some of you guys have sent me emails and talked to me already. So I'm happy to be part of your your group too and the people you've cultivated. Oh, that's great. I mean, Gary Weber, he said in one of his YouTube videos, if you've got it, you won't be able to stop yourself from sharing it. So, and I think that's uh, an interesting idea, if not a correct yeah. one, a true one. Yeah, it's like you got the cure for cancer. Would you hold it on your own and or no, would you share it? And yeah, it's terrifying because I could be like, well, someone's going to yell at me or the FDA will be upset or all this stuff. It was like the mainstream techniques for me ain't cutting it. I got I figured out really what to do and what people aren't talking about. So screw it. I'm going to share it. Well, let's do it again. And I look forward to it. Cool. Let's do it. Thank you. Well, thanks again to John for this wonderful and impactful discussion. Really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate you for being part of it. Now, I mentioned that there is a part of this puzzle that I think most of us really, really need. And I sometimes call it Metivier's razor. And I am, yes, so arrogant that (laughs) I named a principal after myself. But why not? You only live once, right? And this is actually an interesting point because so many times our own egos cause us anxiety and we never have fun in life. So when I thought about this, do I really want to like create all of this self-reflection where I'll think, oh my God, that's so arrogant to name off a thing. And then I'll feel bad and have all this guilt. Then I just thought, no, you have to learn how to control your mind and just enjoy, right? Because Occam got a razor named after him. Why shouldn't I, right? But here's the thing. And this is what I really, really want people to understand, especially those who need it the most. Neuroplasticity is real. You really can change, not just the way your mind operates, but the physical structure of your brain. And in order to do that, most of us are going to need extended exposure to the kinds of techniques and tactics and strategies that John and I talked about today. There are the things that I've been teaching for many, many years, and many, many people, unfortunately, they rob themselves of the full benefit because they don't do it for long enough in order for it to work. So there's lots of scientific words that we could use all about myelin sheaths that wrap around the neuronal connections and how that positive and negative ions fire at certain speeds through these connections, on and on and on and on. But at the end of the day, in order for these connections to build the robustness that really deepens whatever strategy you're using, whether it's for anxiety reduction or it's for using memory techniques so you can be as fast as John, or even at my speed, which is not as fast as John, not even close, but I can still use mnemonics reliably. There's a principle of 90 to 100 days minimum of consistent practice of these kinds of techniques over time in order for the brain to shift, to change, to adapt, to grow 
strength, robust connections that actually make it possible for it to start to take on an autopilot effect where you actually crave doing the exercises that help you. You almost get a positive addiction. You can't stop yourself. You have to go and do it. This is really the sweet spot. It's part of what I call cruising altitude in the victorious mind. This ability to just simply come back to what you need to be doing when you have turbulence in life, right? But you just want to be able to do it whether you have turbulence or not. Keep showing up, keep showing up, keep showing up. So that's Metivier's razor. Well, actually what Metivier's razor is, is that any of these techniques that aren't put into practice for 90 days minimum, you simply do not deserve the right to say, I tried, because it's not really trying. You know that phrase, the good old college try? That's part of where this razor comes from. Is that Semesters are, are different at different schools and so forth, but they tend to have a 90-day realm, a semester. And why would that be? Why would humanity have evolved semesters that tend to take that amount of time? Did, did we know implicitly that we basically need that amount of time in order for a depth of understanding to settle in? Quite possibly. And it could be that we have that because semesters were designed that way and then over time, maybe through an epigenetic, I think you would call it, uh, process, we, we, we start to adopt it and shift and change, whatever. The whole point is that this is what we see in the data. And I've seen it time and time again when I'm adopting a new skill, whether it's juggling or it's doing certain card magic things that I like to do without a minimum of 90 days of practice. It's very, very difficult for it to take hold in the brain so that there's an automatic ability to do it well, but also a craving to show up to the practice where you just desire being better and better and becoming better and better still because you're maintaining this. And that really is endless growth in, in a real practical way. Not just this myth of like numbers go up all the time, but a legitimate way in which you get better and better. Because when you keep coming back to the practices that make you calm, that make you focused, that make it possible for you to use memory techniques or any technique, you do get better and better because it has compound interest. You keep having more and more maintenance and that maintenance itself is better because when you look back at the past you see this wonderful life of stability and absence of suffering and or at least reduction of suffering and when it comes to the learning techniques that we talk about so much at the magnetic memory method headquarters and in this world you get the value of having learned and remembered so many intricate, wonderful, nuanced details. So less than 90 days, please, please stop yourself from saying, well, I tried this and it didn't work. Wait for at least 90 days. I'd say 100, but 90 is, uh, <laughs> is somehow more attractive to me. <laughs> and it, it, it is one of the scientific studies that I read about this. It said 90 days, but what if it's 120? So what? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop stopping. Let time provide the compound interest, so to speak, that can only come when time is involved. If you need help with that magnetic memory method, <laughs> if you need help with that, Victorious Mind Live will do the trick. Whether you get ultimately involved in the full program or not, come and get the Happy Memory Palace guided meditation at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VML. It will start this process and you're welcome to use it every day for 90 days. It doesn't even have to be every day. Some of the studies I've seen show a minimum of four times per week in order to get benefits. But keep that in mind, you know, four times a week is, is not that huge of an investment of time. But anything less than that, you're basically asking to not have the results that could be possible. And every day is gonna be better than four times a week. Five is gonna be better. And it's gonna be better even just for you being able to pride yourself in the discipline that comes from showing up. So get started. And if you want to be part of this program or even just want to signal your interest so you have a chance to be one of the people who gets the limited seats for Victorious Mind Live, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VML for Victorious Mind Live. Get involved in this happy memory palace guided meditation and keep these principles in mind because if you really want a true and lasting enduring change, that's what it's going to come down to is consistency over time. And those principles, minimum four times a week, minimum 90 days, 
try to push into it, be a completist, be a maximalist in order to really, really sink deep into that change and help make sure that it not only lasts time <clears throat> and help ensure that it not only stands the test of time, but that it compounds and makes your life so much more rich and valuable so that your memory is it, the most exciting place to be as you look back and say, look at all that I've accomplished. Look at all the peace that I've had, all of the absence or at least the reduction of suffering because I finally figured out how to take action over and over and over again. That's what I call being magnetic. And if you'd like more along these lines, stick around and check out my previous conversation with John Graham, where we talk about some of the relationship between memory training and enlightenment and even going beyond enlightenment, because after all, enlightenment is just a word. Thanks again. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.